In the heart of the Amazon rainforest, the Yanomami people have lived for millennia, isolated and untouched. In 1967, that all changed when anthropologists and geneticists stepped onto their sacred grounds. These scientists, driven by curiosity and ambition, allegedly endangered the Yanomami's very existence. They took blood samples, promising to return with medical aid, but many believe they introduced harmful pathogens instead. As disease spread, the Yanomami's trust wavered. Was this a genuine quest for knowledge or an experiment gone awry? The Yanomami blood controversy is not just about vials of blood taken under dubious circumstances. It's a story about ethics, responsibility, and the price of knowledge. In November 1964, driven by an insatiable curiosity, a team of researchers led prominently by Napoleon Chagnon and James Neal arrived in a small jungle village in Venezuela to study one of the most remote tribes on Earth, the Yanomami Indians. The Yanomami themselves were rumored by other tribes and by the earliest explorers to be wild and dangerous. So dangerous that in 1920, one of the first Americans to encounter them, the geographer Hamilton Rice, opened fire with a machine gun fearing that the Yanomami were cannibals. The initial research goals seemed straightforward. Understand the Yanomami way of life, their social structures, rituals, and perhaps their evolutionary significance. Armed with notepads, cameras, and the promise of modernity, they made their first forays into the depths of the Amazon. Neil had long been interested in unadulterated societies. A self-professed eugenicist, he believed that modern democracies, with their free breeding among large populations, violated the process of natural selection and promoted genetic entropy. Tribal people, in his view, were likely to have superior genetic material because they lived according to the survival of the fittest principle. That is, they were ruled by polygamous chiefs who had triumphed over their rivals. He hoped that by studying the Yanomami, he might be able to isolate specific genes for male leadership or, as he put it, an index of innate ability. This view of the Yanomami as a superior breeding stock was not generally shared by Neil's medical colleagues. Most of them believed that the Yanomami, like other Amerindian tribes, were immune depressed. Neil had learned of an outbreak of measles that had occurred the previous fall among Brazilian Yanomami. For what he later called an exercise in preventative medicine, Neil's team brought a thousand doses of live measles vaccine into the upper Orinoco region. Neil was eager to collect data on vaccine responses. At the time, geneticists wanted to study tribal people who had no measles antibodies in order to determine how their immune responses differed from those in modern societies. In 1966, Francis Black, a geneticist at Yale had vaccinated a Brazilian tribe, the Tirio, with a measles vaccine in the hope of using the vaccine virus as a model of natural measles. Black had chosen the widely used Schwartz measles vaccine rather than the older vaccine, the Edmundston B. In 1962, when an immune-compromised child with leukemia died after receiving Edmundston B, one of the vaccine's inventors, John Enders, had cautioned that the strain was dangerous for immune-depressed people. Measles vaccines were also known to produce unusually severe reactions in people suffering from anemia, dysentery, or chronic exposure to malaria, and the Yanomami suffered from all three. Neil took the Edmundston B vaccine, rather than the Schwartz, into Yanomami territory. Over the next three months, the worst epidemic in the Yanomami's history broke out. Because quarantines were not rigorously imposed, the disease spread to dozens of villages scattered across thousands of square miles. It is estimated that between 15 and 20 percent of the Yanomami who contracted measles died in the epidemic. This did not stop researchers from continuing their anthropological study. As the scientific team, with Shagnon and Neil at the helm, delved deeper into their research, their focus took an unexpected turn. In the quest to understand genetic patterns, resistances, and the overall health profile of the Yanomami, blood samples became a primary interest. It started simply enough. With syringes and vials in tow, the researchers approached the Yanomami with assurances. The idea conveyed was that these samples would unlock invaluable insights about human health and biology. 
For the Anomami, this was uncharted territory. Their understanding of blood was deeply symbolic, connected to life force and ancestry. Giving it away wasn't a mere medical procedure, it was a gesture of trust. As Davi Kapanawa, a prominent Yanomami shaman and activist would later say, our blood is a part of us. It's not just fluid, it's our life, our identity. His words pointed out the Yanomami's deep spiritual connection to every part of their being. The blood wasn't just a research sample. It was a piece of a people, of their history and existence. In January 1968, Timothy Ash, a documentary filmmaker, arrived on the Upper Orinoco. Ash described the research process as follows. The villagers are studied on a production line. Numbers are assigned to them. Specimens of their blood, saliva, and stools are collected. Impressions of their teeth are made, and they are weighed and measured by the physical anthropologists. Each person was also photographed and paid with what Neil called a cash transaction based on trade goods. As vial after vial was filled, the Yanomami might have assumed that this transaction would bring them tangible benefits, perhaps better health given the context of the introduced vaccinations and medical checks. However, the samples once taken began a journey far beyond the Amazon. They traveled to distant labs, subjected to tests and studies, the results of which the Yanomami remained unaware. And at this point, the narrative tilts. From an expedition seeking understanding, it morphed into a tale of appropriation. The very essence of a people, their blood, was now thousands of miles away, stored in cold vats. Years after the expeditions and the myriad research papers, a storm was brewing. The epicenter of this storm was a book titled Darkness in El Dorado by Patrick Tierney. Tierney, through meticulous research, presented a narrative starkly different from the official records of the expeditions. His pages did not just detail the scientific activities, but raised grave questions about the very ethics of the entire endeavor. According to Tierney, the Yanomami weren't just subjects of study. They were, at times, manipulated and exploited. One of the most contentious claims was about the blood samples. Tierney suggested that not only were these samples taken without full informed consent, but they were also stored indefinitely and used for various undisclosed purposes far from the initial promises made to the Yanomami, and Tierney didn't stop there. He delved into allegations of the researchers exacerbating conflicts among the Yanomami to study their warfare patterns and even claims of medical negligence that might have resulted in a deadly measles outbreak. The book's release was like a lit match in a dry field. The academic world erupted. Some rallied behind Tierney, commending him for unveiling uncomfortable truths. Others, including many in the anthropological community, criticized him, defending the reputations of Shagnon and Neil, and questioning Tierney's interpretations. Regardless of where one stood in this debate, darkness in El Dorado undeniably opened a Pandora's box. It forced a re-evaluation of research ethics, especially when working with vulnerable populations. The book, in essence, wasn't just about the Yanomami or a single expedition. It was a mirror held up to academia, reflecting upon the power dynamics inherent in research, especially with indigenous communities. It asked, who gets to tell a story and how? Whose voice matters? Yet some pointed to the Yanomami. Their voice, largely silent in the earlier discourse, was now echoing loudly. Critics questioned the idea of taking blood without full consent of introducing foreign elements into a closed ecosystem without understanding the repercussions, of observing human beings like specimens without acknowledging their agency. One of the lingering symbols of the Yanomami controversy was the vials of blood kept preserved in distant labs far from their origin. The samples in many ways encapsulated the core issues, consent, respect, and the rights of indigenous people over their own biological material. The calls for repatriation grew louder, and after years of negotiations, the samples were finally returned to the Yanomami in 2010. This act wasn't merely procedural. It was symbolic, representing a circle completed, a wrong acknowledged, and an effort made to set things right. Kopanawa's reflection on the event was simple yet profound. Our ancestors can rest now, knowing we've brought back what was taken. 
It was a moment of closure, but also a testament to the long journey of understanding and respect.